Ngobe ngitandile Ngobe ngitandile Wangifela Over 10 years ago in the year 1992 Vusi a 22 years old young man from Swaziland received a telephone call which changed his life forever During that call he was told that he is HIV positive I had spent the night with a, 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 a beautiful woman uh, whom after five days uh, she decided to call me and tell me that uh, I'm going to die. In the same year, in another African country, Uganda, an Anglican priest Gideon went to test himself for HIV. The result of this test was also positive. I lost my wife in 1991. And uh, six months later, my sister in law came and said, You know, your wife died of an HIV AIDS related illness. Uh, I was really shocked to hear that because she had died suddenly. I, didn't, I hadn't connected it with HIV AIDS. So in 1992, I decided to go and find out whether I was HIV positive myself. And of course, the test confirmed my worst fears. I was HIV positive. Some years later, in 1996, Felicia from Tanzania and Kari from Finland received this same shocking news. Uh, I was about to go to America to work there and I needed to go to a doctor's appointment to get the visa and on that uh, appointment I found out that I was HIV positive and uh, I couldn't go. And uh, for four months after that, um, my health went to the worst con condition and uh, I needed to retire. And uh, my doctor gave me only two months to live. And uh, that was the year when the new medication came to Finland. And only for about one month after I started to take pills, I was mm, recovering and uh, started to feel okay and been all right ever since. My husband died in 1996, so that's why I take the time to go to the hospital and check my blood test. I found it, it I'm HIV positive. Just recently, in the year 2002, the doctor told also to Uni, a young woman from Swaziland, that she has been infected by HIV virus. I had developed a persistent cough and I would go to the doctor, he would give me antibiotics and a cough remedy. So when I was on antibiotics, I was okay. But the moment I finished taking the antibiotics, I just went back to the cough, uh, fever, and it was terrible. So I went on this antibiotic course for three times. After that, I just knew you know, there must be something wrong with me, so I suggested the HIV test. So when he told me on the day, August 14, and he asked me, how do you feel? I just told him, well, it's okay. I mean, I had already been start, I had already started working on HIV and AIDS issues, so I had been telling people that life doesn't end when you realize that you're HIV positive. So I suddenly had to say the same thing to myself now. After Kideon found out that he is HIV positive, he experienced a shock. The biggest shock was not when I got results. The biggest shock was when I discovered that my wife had died of an HIV AIDS related illness. By the time I decided to take an HIV test, I had prepared my mind. Uh, and I was 98% sure that the results will be positive. So I didn't get the shock at the time I got the results. I got the shock uh, when I learned that actually my spouse had died of an HIV accelerated illness. Gary from Finland thought that his life had come to an early end. The doctor is telling you that, oh no, there's no reason to worry yet. You might live something like 10 years or so. But then again, after a few weeks, he says that, oh, I'm sorry, but you're not going to live. Mm -hmm. So it's like, 
With this disease, you have to get used to for changing. I haven't got a shock because my relatives and my sister, they are close to me and they love me so much. So that's why they give me a company. Yeah, they are supporting me to the maximum. So I don't mind and I don't care that I, I, I will die with this problem. I will die like anybody if God wish. Wusi and Yuni from Swaziland just wanted to die. I thought I had accepted, but four days later, no, I was in shock. I was in, I just lost it. I just completely lost all hope. And then I was thinking, because it was August, I was even thinking I wouldn't last until December. So I was already preparing for my death and my funeral. I felt so devastated. I felt so scary. I concluded in my mind that I'm already dead. So uh, life became very difficult for me after that uh, phone call, such that uh, in a few weeks I started to develop a headache, uh, which was very terrible. Uh, that was 1992 uh, when I discovered. So uh, at that time at home in Swaziland, uh, there was nothing much said or talked about HIV. So I thought I was the only one who was with this problem. And uh, with the headache, uh, I began to think that uh, now death is approaching. So because it was very terrible, I even uh, contemplated to uh, commit suicide. One of the most difficult part for Fusi, Kideon, Felicia, Kari and Yuni was to decide whether to tell their family members and friends about the HIV virus or just keep it secret. The fear of losing all loved ones and the fear of stigma were there to overcome. The people I talked to reacted with shock. Whether it's my family, whether it's my friends, whether well, it's my bishop, it was all news that was too much to, to receive. But shock quickly turned into empathy. For me, it was easy to pass this way because the day we go to the hospital to the blood test, it's my sister. We were together with my sister. So my sister, she's the one who's taking this, all of the, my problems. So she's the one who's telling the sisters and brothers, mom and dad. So for me, I was just sitting down and listening to them. I learned of my HIV status in 1992. I kept it secret amongst my family for five years. You know, for five years. And that was torture. I told my parents right away. And uh, my mom asked first, that do you know where did you get it from and the second question was that do you know that have you passed it to someone else and that is the one issue that i think is common to all of us that uh, that would be the worst nightmare to me if i would pass this disease to someone else well my mother she was the first one to know and she told me she loves me, irrespective of my status. Today I'm still her daughter and I just have to believe that I'm going to leave and she was going to be there for me. And my director at work, she was also very supportive. She even came to my house. I told her about it, we talked about it and she was ready to give me any support. She said any support that she can give, she would give it to me. The first time when I opened up about my HIV status, it was mainly because I had uh, attended a, 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 my first international conference. I, I met a lot of people who were open about their HIV status. I met people who were so alive 
with their HIV status. So to me, I was more inspired to live more openly and, and positively about my HIV status. So the first person I was able to talk to was my sister, my younger sister. The response that I received from her was so positive that she said to me, uh, 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 she knows of many diseases that are very bad, mm -hmm. that are health hazard, uh, including cancer and so forth. And HIV is amongst them. And the way I look at you, it's like uh, you are, uh, are, are taking care of yourself. So what I can say is that keep it up and take good care of yourself. And don't forget one thing, I'm still your sister. You know, that is was the only thing I needed in, in the world. What comes for the rest of the family and the relatives, everybody been accepting me very well and supporting me. And, uh, and I have reason to believe that they are proud of me. One of the things that makes me live now is the response I've got from people I have shared to their assurance that they will love me they will support me irrespective of my new situation. Three days after my sister telling them, I heard people phoning me, phoning me, phoning me, said, no, Felicia, you are okay, don't worry, we are together with you. You just leave, we will help you. When you get any problem, you just tell us, we are together with you. So for me, it was very easy, very Let's easy. Let's join our hands. Let's join our hearts. The stigma I get is not from my family, is not from my friends, is not from my church leaders. I probably the stigma I get is from people who don't know me, people who don't understand why I should be positive. To be honest with you, I never got to tell my mother. Every time I would sit with my mother and I would be thinking behind my back, how do I tell her? Uh, uh, sometimes she would be very happy such that I said to myself, no, 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 I will spoil the happiness. Maybe I will tell her tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, she's so sad, maybe she's so low. And I said to myself, no, 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 today is not good, I will wear her. <laughs> so I never got to tell her. Until my sister, of course, uh, decided to tell her for me. And uh, I was working somewhere in the, in the other region, and they told me that my mother, he, she now knows. So I rushed to home so that to see how she is, you know. And uh, there is one thing I'll never forget. When I opened the door and, and entered the house, she never said anything. She just uh, stood up and came forward to me and hugged me. Amen. Something she has never done in my life. I had a problem how to tell my father that I was HIV positive. See, my father is a lay preacher in the Lutheran Church, and then I just broke the news to him. And, oh my goodness, the silence that followed. He just went very quiet, and I didn't know what he was thinking. So after a long time, he just took a deep breath, and, it, and he just said, well, this is it. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can change. We just have to learn to live with him. How is it then to live with HIV in Africa? In Swaziland, the stigma is still there, but the medication is available for the most of the people. In Swaziland, there is too much stigma, such that it becomes a, a, a problem of the poor, the problem of the people who are just there, the minority, the outcasts. Uh, so there is so much that we need to do. We can have the access to treatment. Uh, as my brother has also said, treatment is not everything. We can have access to VCT centers. We can have access to many things, the, the, the campaign against HIV. But if we have it actually achieved 
uh, the Berkeley Arcade Stigma. We are way ahead. I mean, uh, uh, beyond, behind uh, 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 reaching our goal in terms of HIV. We need to deal with stigma. I think the people in Sweden are very supportive because even the private sector, the business companies, they all, most of them are in this medical aid cover for their employees. So when people know that they're HIV positive, they, at least there's something they can do about the medication. And well, for those that cannot afford it, well, it's still an issue, of course, because they are quite expensive. Just recently, our government uh, is trying to put in place a support mechanism for people who cannot access or who cannot afford the drugs for themselves to come and get it from the government hospitals. In Uganda, people are more open about their HIV status. We have priests who say I'm positive, I'm a commander, I'm a generals who say I'm positive, you know, uh, professionals who are saying we are positive. So it's, 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 it's so, I mean, there is medication but it's not very available to everyone. Uh, and like in Swaziland where I'm hearing of medical cover and all that, still access to antiviral treatment is a private affair. Your friends, your family members have to, to make an effort to contribute. But when they are very poor and struggling with their own health and their own problems, then it becomes very hard. But in Tanzania, people are still afraid to talk about HIV. Although the medical treatment is available, but only for those who can afford it. The problem is the stigma and the discrimination. When you find it, people they don't say their status because of discrimination. So the medicine is available, but the problem is people, they are poor. The medication is free for everybody in Finland, but an HIV positive person can be rejected by the society. I know a lot of people who have lost their, their jobs and their houses, and even their children can go to the nursery or kindergarten because their parents have HIV. Let us then. Let us even if Busi, Gideon, Felicia, Gary and Uni come from different countries and different cultures, they all have one thing in common, that is hope. They know that an HIV positive person can have a life, even a love life. In 95 when I proposed I wanted to marry again, people said, what? <laughs> you are dying tomorrow, I said, but are you God? It's possible to, to, to get a baby if you are HIV positive, because now there are this medicine, the therapy. So even me, I think I, I'll go with that medicine because I want to get a baby. I don't have a baby. A lot of people are getting married every day. Most of them do not know their HIV status. Uh, if they do, they are not open about it. AIDS is like a, an eye opener to the world. Are you loving the way you should love? We are the soldiers in the army. We have to fight although we want to cry. We have to carry the bloodstained banner. We have to carry it until we die. Our fear is our only courage. God is our only hope. Thank you. Together we stand and fight until we reach the end. Let's join our hands. Let's join our hearts. Together in Christ we are one.